it has seeped into my psyche and it has become a part of me and I reflect on it. Welcome to Tales with the Sales, where we discuss stories that matter because you are living one. I'm your host, Jane DeSales. I'm a writer, poet, and storyteller. It is my pleasure to introduce you to authors as we explore how fiction impacts our lives and culture. My guest today is Annette Young. She has dabbled in the visual and performing arts throughout her life. In addition to being a writer, she is also an accomplished pianist and an aspiring but out of practice violinist. Her debut novel, A Distant Prospect, won Best Fiction from Catholic Reads in 2018. The following year, By Violence Unavenged, won Best Historical Fiction from Catholic Reads. No doubt her studies in literature, history, and philosophy have aided her in her quality historical fiction novels. She is currently working on the remaining two books of her World War II historical trilogy, In the Heart of Kings, of which By Violence Unavenged is the first volume. I really look forward to all of these volumes, including number two, Outside Heaven's Sway, and three, A Balanced Wheel. Hi, today we have with us Annette Young, and I am just so excited to hear what you've brought for us today, and surprise, surprise, it's not fiction today, it's a poem. Uh, The poem is by W.B. Yeats, and it's Ed Wishes for the Cloths of Heaven. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths, inwrought with golden and silvery light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half-light. I would spread those cloths under your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. Wow, I hear your heart in it. And you have the most beautiful voice for reading it. It's just marvelous. <laughs> well, funny, I first encountered that poem in singing. Um, when I was 17, I was at school still, and I was taking singing lessons. And it was so it was in music form. And the music that was put to this particular poem is utterly beautiful. There are some wonderful modulations and um, it was sort of a personal achievement too because um, the song um, towards the conclusion has a high E which is held at pianissimo for about eight counts. It's a very difficult thing to do for a singer and I remember doing it and my singing teacher was so pleased for me and it was such a, I mean, the whole experience of learning to sing and everything, um, the, the way it fused music and literature um, was something very important to me at that point. And that poem in particular, what it says, is also of incredible personal significance, um, both at the time and continuing through my life, that, yes, I'm a person who, wishes for the cloths of heaven, the aspirations are high, you know, it's it's wanting everything, wanting wanting all of it and also wanting to lay it at the feet of the whole world. You know, there's my extrovert personality coming out there that I, I would I would just spread the table thick. I, I would lay everything out. I will I will, you know, there it is. And um it's very much what I do with all my writing, my music, my art, everything is that that desire for the cloths of heaven. Um, but then there's of course the and the spreading of what I can what I can, which of course is but my dreams. Will we have really is that very private, intimate world of desires and aspirations and imagination and beauty and experience and all that we are. And we give all that we are, we spread it on the feet across, you know, as we spread it to others. It's I think that poem captures so much the vulnerability of the artist in that regard um there's the lofty aspirations and then the reality but i being poor have only my dreams and then and it goes from this aspiration to the action already done i have spread my dreams under your feet 
the last line is so interesting because it's a caution, it's a plea, it's and it expresses so much the vulnerability of the writer's position, of the artist's position, and also a sort of a danger inherent in the, the relationship between the artist and the world outside. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. It's almost a threat. Please tread softly. Please be kind to me. <laughs> um, at the same time, it's um, an expression of be, be gentle, come into this, be be aware that, you know, these are my, this is what I'm laying out before you, you know, come to it appreciate it. Ed is one of the children of Leah in the famous Irish myth who is turned by his wicked stepmother into a swan and he's imprisoned and can only as a swan sing these beautiful songs and there's a alienation from the rest of the world. This effectively is one of his songs, shall we say, that Yeats has um, fictionalised. And in The Lady of Shalott, of course, you have a similar thing where she's outside Camelot and she's, con- you know, sort of imprisoned, um, weaving and only looking through a mirror to what she sees. And the moment she, um, you know, when she sees Sir Lancelot coming past and the Tirolira by the river saying Sir Lancelot, you know, she she desires to, to come to him, to to you know, to lay her art, you know, to be her, put herself there, and all he can say to her is, oh, "She had a pretty face." You know, he didn't tread softly on her dreams by any means. And I think both poems really capture the vulnerable nature of art and its relationship with the world, and the whole thing of of the person and our gifts of because the other thing is the gift that is inherent in this um laying one's dreams before one uh, on before the world that ties in very much with john paul ii's theology of the body is captured in love and responsibility um the nature of the person and our personhood as a gift what constitutes us as people and what i as a person bring to the world and that act of love of the giving of oneself um, and there's the writer's art, the writer's craft, the, the work of any artist is that gift of self um, that is so profound. And life-giving. Yes. And I, I absolutely love the way you've tied theology of the body to creative pursuits and mm. and and that your creative pursuits are tied to your created identity Mm. well I think you know I think also as a writer what you know especially when you're writing fiction is the creation of character and those characters are persons and they have to have a very full and rich personhood and that look when I read Love and Responsibility which is some years ago now it just had such a profound effect on me and that that sense of um, the subjective objective or the objective subjective, I should say, um, the self as an object, um, as is as an objective entity. So therefore looking at the person in all its personhood is a, an important job of the writer, shall we say, to, to do and to do well. Well, and I wonder if, I actually don't wonder, I'm pretty sure that John Paul II, if he was listening in on this conversation, would say, well, of course I meant that. I was in (laughs) theatre. I was an actor. I know all about creating a character. Um, Yes. That's just so beautiful. And and it's so true. And that's the thing I've learned about writing fiction myself is these characters are real. Oh, yes. (laughs) To the point of being a pain in the rear sometimes. Absolutely. Yes, yes. (laughs) But it's in that realness that it makes the story matter. Mm. Yes. You know, that character, because that's that's what we identify with. And I wish I wish some modern screenplay writers understood this, mm. that it can't all be chase scenes and gunfire and what yeah. have you. Yes, action's part of the job, um, but character must, must direct action. Um, mm-hmm. Very interesting film we saw the other night, actually. I'm just trying to think. It was, it's about Vietnam vets um, mm-hmm. and the way in which they looked at survivor conflicts in that was so good. 
so so good. Now I can't even remember the title of the film, but um, I'll, I'll, if I if it comes to my mind, I'll I'll, I'll probably shout it out later on. But... Oh, perfect. That's what I would do. Perfect. I'm glad we're on the same page. Well, and I think personifying those experiences, you know, is what gives more empathy. It, it gives more empathy and compassion to our society to actually mm. be able to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Yes. Yes. And especially when you're talking about something that's historically complex, like mm. a war, mm -hmm. it, it's so easy to be caught up in our own historical slash political perspective that we lose mm. the human perspective of what that experience mm. was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, it was said, I think it was a Russian um, literary analysis done by the name of Mikhail Bakhtin, who talks about the novel as being a play of voices, that there's what he calls a dialogic interplay of different voices that all combine to convey the main idea and the themes um, in that story and with the result that when you're writing this whole thing of dissecting the novel into its various voices and making those um, voices come alive in characters and that they take a body and they are expressing a whole, you know, array of ideas, you know, conflicting, um, compatible, and so forth. And it's this combination of ideas that it comes together to make the whole that the novel is. And so you have such a unique opportunity to express, to present things from multiple perspectives, um, whereby the reader can enter into that world. And try on a few different clothes, shall we say, you know, try this, try that, get into the other character and experience things from a completely different perspective outside themselves, outside their own comfort zone many a time. And it's also a very interesting exercise for the writer, might I add, um, in having to do that. And it makes for a very special experience that I don't think is really captured in any other art form. I think you can sometimes experience it with Nonfiction, a little bit. Oh, but there's a voice there directing. There's a voice directing, which is that of the author of the nonfiction work that's um, informing. Um, whereas mm. in fiction, although, yes, one thing is the authorial voice and the narrative voice, and when you have a third person narrative, yes, you do have a bit more of that. But when the narrative shifts to the first person, there's a very different relationship between the, between the narrator, the reader, and the author. That is far more, um, for the reader, far more immersive. I would agree with that, that you spend a lot more time in their mind. In, in, another, in another shoes, you have to step out of your zone, whereas in a third-person narrative, the reader can take, keep a safe distance. It, the other very interesting point is then when you do have a subjective storyteller, which Dostoevsky uses so brilliantly, where the eye of the narrative voice comes through. And that's also a very interesting um, method, um, shall we say, where the reader is just beautifully guided by a narrator that you would like to have to dinner. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the brothers Karamazov, I can remember just wanting to have this guy over and come and talk to me about life, please, because you write about it so amazingly well. I want to know more about you, not your characters. <laughs> There's definitely some authors that I would love to have over for coffee mm -hmm. and just be like, where did you get this? Or, you know, what life story, what experience of your own yes. brought this yes. this whole idea to the fore? George Orwell um, is, is one for me. Um, uh, Eric Arthur Blair, please come to dinner. Um, <laughs> so this, this quiet wit and this insight that has been, you know, gathered it has been acquired from such rich experience in so many different ways and he would make a lovely dinner party companion <laughs> i have to admit i have not read the brothers karamazov yet i am pretty sure i have a copy on my shelf mm -hmm. yep i have so many books on my to be read list i actually mm -hmm. have literally a box of books sitting next to my bed mm -hmm. That's yeah. I'm supposed to read because I haven't made room for them yet on the bookshelves. Oh, yes. And, yes. And we don't have a big house. And yep. I think we've kind of maxed out on bookshelves. <laughs> and I used to be very, very anti e reader because mm -hmm. I love the physical feel 
of a book. And I'm one of these people where I can, you know, I can visualize where on a page a particular yep. passage I want to read yes. was. Yes. And can I tell you how hard that was when I wanted to read something of Chesterton <laughs> to a friend of mine from one of his Father Brown mysteries? Yep. I couldn't find my copy of the paperback book. And I, I, I was like, okay, I need to find this though. And I was able to download a copy yeah. to my e-reader. <laughs> how much harder it was to say, well, I know it was at the end of one of the stories in such and such. <laughs> and you can't flip nearly as easily. Yes, I have a funny story about similar sort of situation, which was when my husband and I were on our honeymoon and we went to Italy um, and we stayed in a B and B in Florence, and it happened to be run by an Australian, and it was full of books in English. And we it was probably about two weeks into our honeymoon, and we were quite welcome to have um, to be able to read and sit in bed for long hours reading books. And one book I picked up was a crime story by Dalgleish, about Dalgleish by P.D. James, and I had to abandon it at page one hundred and thirty-seven. Um, because we left the B and B, and I wasn't going to pick the book, uh, so I dutifully left it back on its shelf. <laughs> it took me two years to find another copy of it. <gasps> back on oh. page one hundred and thirty-seven, where? <laughs> <laughs> And then on a, on another very different note, um, because there were no numbers to memorise, was um, when I was doing my Bachelor of Honours degree um, and I had a history, history research and I decided I would um, use up all my scrap paper. This is going back sort of 40-odd years now. So we did pen and paper then, not not electronic stuff. And so I was using up all my scrap paper to write my notes of, you know, newspaper clippings on microfiche and, you know, diary entries and all sorts of fragments that one picks up when one does history research and had a terrible filing system, absolutely shocking filing system. And so the only way I could remember particular excerpts from like the Illustrated Sydney News of 1856 or whatever it was, was it was on red pen on a piece of graph paper with a torn bit at the top and there's a smudge of ink down in the right bottom corner. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> found it. Found it. Found <laughs> it. So I think what this might be telling us is that we're both a little visual, oh, just a bit. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> so I think it stood me in very good stead as a writer, you know, and having that visual detail um, and the way in which one uses the senses for description. And I think as you'll find with a distant prospect, that the trick of being able to convey something as abstract as music in writing is extremely difficult. So how do you do it? Um, to Also to enable the reader who may not be as musically literate to appreciate. That's me. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> to appreciate the music itself um, without being able to hear it. I love music. I do classical composers and folk study with folk mm -hmm. music study with my kids, mm -hmm. but I don't play an instrument unless doing mm -hmm. the Star Wars theme on the recorder counts. <laughs> that counts. <laughs> but I found that the way that you do cover music in A Distant Prospect, your first novel, is really compelling because as a person who is not an instrument player, that you can still feel the relationship between the musician and their instrument and the relationship between the instrument, the music and the, the various musicians mm -hmm. that I can feel, I can definitely feel it. Mm. So you've done a fabulous job. Oh, thank you. Thank you. With us starting to talk about your book, I was going to ask you this question because mm -hmm. you brought us this amazing poem with like layer upon layer upon layer of beauty. Mm -hmm and apply it to the world and everything. And you did such an amazing job. And so I have to ask, why did you choose to write fiction? Hmm. Um, I came at fiction quite by accident. I've actually never been a writer. Um, I avoided writing of any description at school. 
um, apart from satirical verses about school itself. I um, love it. <laughs> um, I did far more music and acting in my early years, not writing. I'm a lazy sod when it comes to reading. I think it's a bit like Prince Hal and Henry V, um, Henry IV Part One. this layabout, um, easygoing, good for nothing, um, <laughs> who does everything but be a prince, um, <laughs> um, who do everything but be a writer. And I think teachers saw it in me, but... So I think they did the wisest thing was to leave me to my own devices and that was just as well. I enjoyed writing essays. I found it easy to write essays. I enjoyed having detentions where I could write about why I was scooped up in the room after school for not doing my maths homework or whatever um, because, you know, like Winston Smith in 1984, it's a rather creative thing to start getting into Newspeak and putting out something that the government wants you to wants you to read or <laughs> to know about. So, yes, there's the writer thing in me coming out, but um, I avoided it. It wasn't until I got to university doing postgraduate work. That's an interesting thing in its own right. Um, I'll have to say that always right through my life I've had a very vibrant imagination, imaginary friends. It started off with a purple giraffe with pink spots when I was three and it then evolved into persons. Um, imaginary people friends and that really I think got me through school in many ways and became almost a drug addiction in my 20s and 30s and I'll get on to the imagination later on. I ended up going back to university after doing a five-year stint teaching which I did not want to do. I went to do a postgraduate degree because I had questions that my students could not answer as far as literature was concerned. And I think by that stage I'd matured enough to be able to tackle things in depth and I really needed to chew through something. So I did a doctorate in philosophy um, majoring in Charlotte Bronte, her writing, and it was when I was doing um, work on her early works in particular, that I realised that he was somebody who played out their imaginary world with a pen. There was such a, a kindred quality um, between this activity and the way she did it and the, what the, all the goings on inside my head that I spent way too much time in my imagination, way too much time. And it was retreating from reality, but that's a different thing altogether. I'll get onto that later. And so I thought, well, you know, she can do it, so can I. Um, let's try writing a book. And it was to be able to write, I think, in order to understand what writing is about. You know, best way to study a novel is to actually write it yourself and work out how it how it works um, because it is a structural thing and um, I think it's very important for writers to be quite analytic about what they are writing, not just their story, their characters and everything, but as an, the novel as an art form. Mm -hmm. and Charlotte Bronte is certainly um, an amazing example of the novel as an art form. Anyway, so all of a sudden I had to have characters and oh, I had to have a theme. I had to have setting. I had to have uh, <laughs> all sorts of things. Um, the characters had to have a language. You know, they, 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 suddenly, suddenly words become your paint and you have to get them and work them and make make this thing happen. And so it was evolving what had been imaginary friends um, that had been hanging around my head for decades or a couple, about a decade, and making them into literary figures. And that's when the first what became A Distant Prospect um, was written in the mid-90s. I then abandoned it and got on with writing my PhD, having got more of a sense of how these things work. Then it wasn't until after I married and had um, kids that I got back into the writing. So 15 years lapsed between the writing of A Distant Prospect, well, the first draft, shall we say, of A Distant Prospect and what became that book. Um, later on, having had some very relevant life experience and as well as intellectual formation in the meantime. So it got completely written in 2011, 2010, 2011, um, and finished. 
But by that stage, the characters had completely changed and the story itself had um, developed a lot, both in terms of breadth and depth. But it all started there. It started there. And had you not had that iteration? That's right. And in writing that book, I discovered that I could write. I discovered for myself that I could write and that I actually enjoyed it and that it was such a marvellous way of working through problems. And I think that's what I'd always done with my imagination was I had retreated into my imagination to solve things, to understand the world around me. Step back. Let's make up a character about it. Let's let's put it into my character world. Let's let's see, you know, I do it quite subconsciously. And I think also in writing Distant Prospect, that's what I found was how how much it revealed of my own desires, my own aspirations in a way that I had really never given enough space for myself. Mm. I think it's when I discovered how much um, I loved music and how important music was to me. And that was, and that writing it the first time back in 1995, I think that was the first step in that. It was also very much, I think, I wrote myself out of a depression. Mm. Um, So it was amazingly cathartic. There's something about getting out of your brain and out onto the screen or onto a piece of paper Mm -hmm. where you can actually analyze it out there. Yes, Yes, well, Flannery Connor says, um, I don't know what I think until I write what I say. And sometimes it just takes the act of writing to know because the thoughts are just, you know, they're so internal. There's so there's so many layers, layers and layers of thought and the connection between thought and emotion and experience and everything, the past, the present, the future, you know, it's it's a complex world that we humans inhabit in our own personal um, space. and to come to terms with all that takes an awful lot of working through. And I mean, I, I found working through in, in characters um, tremendously um, helpful in that regard. And it's, it's sort of become an ally, even a crutch, shall we say, in that it's, um, it's been very, very good, very satisfying. I can identify that because it's kind of funny when you're writing one of your characters and then you're telling a friend about this character or telling, um, telling, you know, talking to a beta reader about this character. And they're like, well, but this character is immature or this character isn't acting rationally. And you kind of scratch your head and look away and say, yeah, you're right. Because that part of the story and that character was you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dear. So it goes back to your vulnerability of these are my dreams I lay before your feet. <laughs> oh, yes. Look, when I, with the distant prospect, when I finally got it to a stage where it was publishable, you know, there's, ah, oh, look, I didn't want to do it. It was like walking out starkers in front of an audience. You know, it just, it's just ripping your soul open. It, it's, it's laying bare everything. And for me, that, well, that was the first time. And it was, it was scary. Um, you know, if it had not been for my husband <laughs> saying, we're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it, um, it just wouldn't have got there. I'd be still in the corner of a room saying, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. Um, it's um, because it it is so exposing what we were talking about earlier about, you know, the intimate world. You know, there you are writing, which is a very intimate exercise, and all of a sudden it's being taken from you and put out there, you know, for other people to read. And all of a sudden you're in a situation where other people know more about you or think they know more about you because they've read you than you know about them. It's a situation I do not like to be in. (laughs) Vulnerable and, as you put it, stalkers. (laughs) Yes, (laughs) and at somebody else's mercy because, you know, there they are. They've they've got your dreams and, yeah, what are they going to do with it? Um, (laughs) Without doing that, you don't open yourself up to, first of all, the pe- potential to impact their lives and mm-hmm. impact the world. And not like in a, a a preachy kind of way at all, but just impacting their lives with beauty. But the mm-hmm. other thing is you also never hear, this is what I read out mm-hmm. of character X. This is the perspective I got out of this. And you're mm-hmm. like, I I didn't even know I wrote that in. Well, isn't that interesting? Hidden themes um, in a distant prospect, one of the... Ones was um, that 
began to emerge without me having anything to do with it was some um, rash judgment. None of us are guilty of that, so I don't know why we have to worry about it. <laughs> That's not a rash thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 that's the thing is, and, and the reason that all of these hidden themes can come out is because mm. these characters are real. Mm. And it's what I find so interesting as a writer is, you know, this, the subconscious world that starts to emerge and that often it exposes things that you just never realized were so critical in your own makeup, in, in your understanding of the world, in, in how things are and about people. And everything becomes quite surprising. And I particularly found that in writing the second book, um, By Violence Unavenged. Yes, these these hidden themes become such an interesting way of reviewing oneself, of one of reviewing one's situation, re- reviewing what one understands. You know what I just realized is we talk about the vulnerability as a writer, mm. but there's also a vulnerability as a reader. Mm. That you're not experiencing this artwork unless it let you let it it's, touch yes. you. Mm-hmm. Yes, very much so. Wow, I never thought of that about that before. How much do I want to commit? How much am I prepared to go through? What am I prepared to accept? Yeah, it's yeah. it really is a form of travel. Yes, and yes. experience and meeting new people and going no place mm-hmm. new places and. Mm. It's fiction, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. I think it was an interesting thing with um, Distant Prospect and um, when you first encounter Lucy Strawn, who is the narrator, she is somebody who's filled with her own sense of self-loathing and Mm -hmm. it comes through in the narrative and how much does the reader want to identify with that? Yeah, self-hate. And how that projects into the narrative, it colours Lucy's entire world. And this, the reader is very much led into this um, subjective reality and, you know, take it or leave it. Um, What are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. And it it colours how she presents the characters and how she presents the other characters. And then the reader, you know, the degree to which the reader is going to accept Lucy's portrayal of other characters. I have to tell you, Annette. I am reading A Distant Prospect, and I am just savoring this book. And one of the things I love about it, and like you said, there's all these hidden themes, but even the very surface themes are so important to what we're facing. And I'm so grateful that we have a protagonist, a main character that struggles with a physical disability. And just for our listeners, she is a polio survivor. Tell me how you came up with the character of Lucy. Oh, it's, uh, Lucy, oh, she has deep roots, I think, in a number of imaginary characters that I had in my teens. Um, but when one has to make a literary character, um, a lot of things become Oh, very important. Everything has to work towards theme. Everything has to have a meaning. You can't just, oh, hey, I'll have a disabled character, you know. <laughs> no, you can't and throw it in as a token or it's not real. has no real effect, you know, real meaning in the book. Um, but I think it does tie into one of the themes, which is the whole thing of brokenness. We are all a bit crippled. Everybody is broken in some way and that, okay, Lucy's brokenness might be in terms of, yes, polio and also what has happened to her that has dislodged her from her native island um, in, and sent her to Sydney, Australia. Uh, but everybody has that. I mean, the, in, in Distant Prospect, the entire society has been broken by World War I and everybody has something that they're wrestling with inside them. And, in fact, Lucy's physical brokenness, which is so visible, is uh, what she discovers is a magnificent way of understanding others. And in a sense, her vulnerability allows for those who become her friends to show their vulnerability. In many ways, she becomes a safe space, and in that she becomes a leader. Um, quite um, in a way that is um, 
she surprises herself actually is what she's capable of of what she is able to able to do and and i think with that is there's a humility there because it's so grounded on truth it's so grounded on the reality um that gives her tremendous strength her experiences have turned kind of into a double-edged sword that they have both brought her to a place of isolation mm. and pain and trying to protect herself from life. Mm -hmm. But subsequently, that when she allows the vulnerability to step in, it opens up this mm. place of intimacy mm. and closeness and mm. true friendship. Yes. Mm. And, you know, a deeper form of camaraderie. Mm. And like you're saying that learning that as human beings we are interdependent or mm. well, there's the motive of the string quartet that um comes important in the book uh, Lucy is a cellist and the cello up to that point has become a means of retreat as well as a security blanket as well as a way to prove herself in a physical sense because it takes an awful lot of strength to play the cello but then it becomes a point of connection with others and with the outside world. And the string quartet is a rather interesting um, force because it is a make, it may, it's made up of four very different voices which need to come together in order to be able to make music as that harmony that's built on individuality that is so critical in the quartet as a medium as well as in the relationship between the persons that form that quartet. Are you meaning to tell me that we're supposed to have friends that aren't cookie cutter images of ourselves? I think so. What? <laughs> this is news to me. No, I'm kidding. No, I I think that that idea of harmony mm. that that's it is we were all created individuals, yeah. and it's harmony based on difference, not on similarity. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You can't have harmony unless you have three different notes or two different notes. If you have the same note, it's not harmony, it's unison. I'm sure there's about an hour's worth of lessons. We could just chat about that <laughs> every Tuesday for a year. Um, I, I'm just sitting here chewing on that idea. Here's the reason why there needs to be more than one novel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Relationships with all these different people. Mm. finding our way to play our harmony in real life mm. through reading music. Mm. So many good things. Yay, the good things. <laughs> so I don't want to give away any spoilers on this book mm. because people, seriously, this book, A Distant Prospect by Annette Young, is so rich and its literary style is so beautiful, yet it's accessible and you really get into the place and the time and the culture of this experience. I'm loving it. I highly recommend it. But it's not the only novel you have out. No. So tell me, tell me about your other historical fiction. Well, when I finished writing A Distant Prospect, I realized I, had, I could write five more books easy and i just use five as a, a throwaway number I, I could write more books i, I thought just please do be the only one um that was it finished get on with my life um but there are all sorts of stories um that beg to be continued i, I enjoyed writing it i really enjoyed the writing experience and so no sooner than distant prospect was published i thought right roll up my sleeves and I, i'm going to write more and so I it, the second book which develop, has developed into a trilogy because it's a big topic and I will get onto that is like a sequel to a distant prospect but then it's also a work in its own right. The trilogy is in the hearts of kings, and the first volume of that, by violence unavenged, is out, and I'm writing the second and third. And it shifts from the late 1920s, which is when A Distant Prospect is set, to the 1930s and World War II. And also the characters, of course, have grown from being teenagers to adults. 
therefore the perspective and the attitudes and the understanding of things also shifts quite dynamically. I was rather scared about writing 1930s and World War II because you know what's coming and I think it's a very tricky thing with regard to fiction set at that particular time. We know how it ends but when you're writing it you don't know that or at least your characters don't know that and mm. it's a big challenge and also the events are horrific. The I don't think humanity's ever experienced oh, World War One was pretty bad but World War Two globally was something extraordinary and how you actually portray that um, is a big, big challenge uh, to write about. Anyway, so the narrative actually shifts in a distant prospect from to by violence unavenged. It's um, told through the perspective of another character, and I really enjoyed. I, I needed to make a shift. Um, I needed to. Um, because also the other character, the, the other character had more story to tell um, in a more relevant way. That was had to be done that way, and so it was an interesting challenge because in *By Violence Unavenged*, bridging from a distant prospect in a way to to provide summaries and links and so forth to that other book instead of just going straight out with the same narrative voice of course using a different narrator therefore a different perspective so the perspective on the characters in distant prospect as told by the narrator of, Devi of by violence unavenged mm -hmm. um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a very different shift so what the reader does with that uh, it's, that's my game um <laughs> Um, so would you like, I think I have to give a spoiler in that is that the narrator shifts from Lucy to Phoebe, one of the Ooh. minor characters in A Distant Prospect becomes the major protagonist in the trilogy. Oh, I'm very interested because I have to admit, I was one of those rebels in high school that, you know, hung out mm -hmm. with the smokers in the parking lot. Yep. And, and so, um. <laughs> I identify with Phoebe mm. in that prior part of my life. And so I would, I'm, I'm actually really excited to read from her perspective because I can tell you so far in the book, she's painted at a somewhat sympathetic, but a very hard character. Mm. Um, and I'm sure she becomes more sympathetic. And I know that all characters experience growth in books and things like that. Yes. And I don't dislike her, but I'm just like, oh. I don't dislike her because, like I said, mm. I know her. I, know <laughs> <laughs> I love to hear stories narrated by imperfect characters, if that makes mm. sense. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. An imperfect narrative voice is wonderful um, because uh, I think – Readers have to learn. I, I feel terribly patronizing saying this, but the narrator is not the author and that what the narrator says is not gospel and there's nothing better than a very scarred narrative voice to bring that forward. And it allows for more freedom of evaluation. You know, you're not being told what to think here. You, you know, I mean, I, as, a, as a reader, I do not like being told what to think by an authoritative um, or narrative voice. Um, I get very annoyed. I will stop reading. I will throw the book away and, and walk off in a half. Uh, I like to be challenged by a narrative voice that is partial, appealing, interesting, um, but is not is not telling me what to think. I'll make up my own mind. Thank you very much. Likewise, I think when I write, I think I like to be able to do that as well. I leave, I like to leave the reader free. It doesn't stop me from. Um, or my characters from saying things that they think, um, but there is that 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 flexibility. That that yeah, well, yes, there is that flexibility there. Almost a freedom. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that's nice. It just makes me think, like you were talking about love and responsibility. That love mm. requires freedom, mm. and so even when you're talking about a work, that you need to feel mm -hmm. free to enjoy this. Yes, yes. And not, this is. <laughs> yes, you must think this and this is how it was. Well, no, it's not how it was. You know, no history is like that. No literature is like that. The subjective world is such a fascinating reality in its own right. That's what we writers can, can convey so well, um, is a point of view. And so with all of this in mind, 
what is it that you hope your readers leave with mm. after reading your books? <laughs> Um, well, they're, they're my aspirations, um, which may not necessarily translate into the reading experience. <laughs> I think it's to be left to think. From my, my own personal experience in reading, I love to be able to immerse myself into another world, in another world whereby I am living part of that world and I can take that world with me when I close the covers of that book and that world stays with me for as long as I choose to. And it, you know, it comes back, it shifts in and out and you just have this lovely point of reference once again with the experiences of characters in that book. Um, I had an interesting experience reading Dostoevsky over the last few years and so I read Crime and Punishment, the idiot and the brothers Karamazov in succession. And it took me a long time. It had to take a long time because you're dealing with a writer of incredible density, writing of incredible density, um, profundity, um, detail in all levels, psychological detail, visual detail, everything, as well as complex stories, um, uh, difficult themes dealt in, with com in complex ways and it demanded a slow slow read i would read a few pages and just put brothers caramels on the side and leave it for a week and come back the next week and read a little bit more and this slow consumption of this work i find i found i found it hard going and at the end of it immediately it was like Thank goodness it's finished. I don't know. I don't remember what I read. But three years, four years on from reading it, now I find I'm coming back to refer to it. Mm. It has seeped into my psyche and it has become a part of me and I reflect on it. And yes, I was reflecting on it to a degree between reads as I was reading it. And now there's this reflective thing. I think I'm ready to go again. If I can leave that sort of imprint, in readers where the book has become part of them and it affects them one way at one point and they chew over it. So maybe they didn't like it, but then somehow it's gotten in and you come back to it and you come back to it. It becomes part of you. you know, mm. it's, it's, it's part of your culture, part of your world, part of your thing. And then you go out and you do something more with that, you know, and that's that, that, um, sort of the stone in the pond effect. The stone's been dropped in the pond and then the ripples extend, 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 extend. There's no knowing where and how it'll go, how big the pond is depends on how big our world is, but it, it's that ripple effect. Yeah, if my books can have that ripple effect, I'd be pleased, but I'm just a stone that got dropped and I'm down the bottom of the pond. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Some lovely child will go and find it because it's mm -hmm. a perfect round skipping stone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And and those are of value. So mm. even at the bottom of the pond, mm. they find well, a place to get picked up again. I think that's important to realise as a writer that um, you have absolutely no guarantee of how your work is going to be received and when any reception, if at all, is going to take place. Once again, it comes back to the tread softly because you tread on my dreams. Um, okay, the dreams are out there and you have no way of knowing what really that effect is going to be and that's it's important to accept that I'm, I'm thinking out aloud here yeah it's a good place for me to be at the bottom of the pond um that's where i need to be <laughs> um and one has to accept that the fact that one might not make any impact or one might make a ma magnificent impact but one is not to know about it and one does not need to know about it um, it's good for the morale when one does know about it but that's not what writing is about, this incredibly intimate act, is to be left to be um, an intimate experience. And to almost let your story have its own life. That's right. Its own journey. That's right. Well, it's been 10 years or so since I've written A Distant Prospect and here I am talking about it. And I have moved on as a person. And now here it is affecting you as a reader. I'm writing, you know, in the thick of writing a second volume to a trilogy and it's driving me nuts. And 
I'm, I'm immersing myself in other characters and so forth. And yes, and you know, that book will go out and I'll go down to the bottom of the pond again. You know, it's, it's an interesting situation. Well, and the way you can look at it is it can either be down at the bottom of the pond making mm-hmm. ripples because mm-hmm. you threw it out there or it mm-hmm. can sit in your file cabinet. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not a good place for it to be. No, it's not because <laughs> this work, there is, there's reason for it mm. that these voices came to your head somehow mm. and that they weren't meant to stay in your head, mm. obviously. Mm. Yes, well, it's funny how it developed too, because you know, I think look, it's an incre- a voice is a, a critical thing in writing. You know, each character has to have a voice, and one of the challenges of writing a distant prospect was that you had four um, central characters, the four characters in the quartet. So, writing dialogue with four people involved in it quite often, without saying, and also writing in the first person. So. As if you're writing in the third person, you would be able to say so and so said, and the other person said, and uh, mm-hmm. but not in this, it would completely butcher the flow of the work. So it meant that each voice of each character had be so, had to be so distinct that the reader could work out who was saying what just by the diction. Mm. Um, so crafting those voices, um, it did help that, for instance, Lucy speaks Irish English with an Irish accent, so therefore it, her particular voice was very marked. But each character does have their own diction and to to craft those those voices, that interplay of voice was a real challenge and there um, with the writing with writing, it is very much a rational, um, highly analytical activity, as well as being a very emotional, immediate, spontaneous activity that, you know, one can have one's characters play out in one's head and one's writing, you know, the you know, keys flying over the over the keyboard, fingers flying over the keyboard. And, you know, you're playing out the scene and writing it down, you know, as, as it's played in your imagination. But it comes to a point where you have to stop that and take a pretty hard, cold look at it and then craft it. And it's really predatory, dissecting your own work, making it, um, honing it, you know, scrapping bits, um, pushing everything towards that final thematic end. You know, there's the discipline in it. You know, the scene is not just there because it played out in your imagination. It's there for a reason. What is the reason? And the scrutiny that takes place in the writing process um, is is a demanding one, um, very tricky and very rewarding in the end, I hope, um, <laughs> very excruciating <laughs> in the process. Because you are treading on your own dreams at that point. Right, yes, yes, that's exactly right. Yep, yes. When people are ready to have their lives changed by this work, where should they go to look for it? <laughs> Um, a distant prospect is available on Amazon. That's probably the best place to um, to find it in Kindle as well as in hardcover and softcover. And if you're lucky enough to get the um, physical copy, um, I do love to do my covers. The covers of my books are um, as important as the books themselves in many ways. The cover of a distant prospect features a painting by an artist of the period, um, Grace Cosington Smith, and she did several. Um, paintings of the Sydney Harbour Bridge as it was being constructed at the time. And the bridge motif in A Distant Prospect is well, it's, it's one of the motifs of connection between the individual and the outside world. Um, and there are bridges inside Lucy that need to be built. And the bridge that's being built on the outside, this amazing structure of the early 19, late 1920s, um, mirrors the bridge that Lucy is forging between herself and her immediate surrounds. Anyway, so the bridge is important. Um, anyway, that's beside the point. Um, By Violence Unavenged is also available um, on Amazon. See, again, in Kindle as well as in hard and soft cover. It also has a beautiful cover. Fantastic. Yes, it does. And I tell you, I... I don't know why, but I definitely have a thing for World War One and World War Two, And I especially like that I get to hear it from a non-American perspective mm-hmm. because 
that's the literary perspective I'm typically exposed to. Well, I find I find that's very interesting, especially with the wars, um, and especially from an Anglo Western point of view, um, because oh, well, we won, didn't we? So we're in a really comfortable position. Uh, I think it's really important to get out of that comfortable position and see those wars from a different angle. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely, very much what I try to do with both books, and that things are not a fait accompli. It, you know, it's it's really interesting with World War II fiction how we can be a bit righteous righteous about it. You know, it's always taught, told from the right side, and everybody's always doing the right thing. Right. Um, <laughs> Oh, let's move away from that, please. Um, let's shift shift the boundaries. Um, and certainly I think that's an important thing to do with World War II fiction. I think also um, that one also can forget how attenuated the war was. You know, it's six years. It's really important for World War II. We've, we've got to this situation now where there's a lot of books about World War II, but it's also almost becoming pulp. That you know, it, that's great, but it doesn't adequately convey the the bigness of the whole thing. One film that did that really, really well was um, it's called The Airman. The the one by Angelina Jolie did it. it goes for about three hours, and you get this sense of the drawn out nature of it, and the difficulty of that, the difficulty that it plays on the human psyche, the powers of endurance, the choices you make, the um, the way in which you have to just simply survive and what you're going to do about that, um, what becomes important to you, um, how that shifts over time, and then how the final outcome will change your attitude and understanding of things. Uh, World War Two needs big books, big fiction. Oh. Big fiction. Have Have you read The Red Horse by Eugenio Corti? No. Oh, it's from Ignatius Press. And yeah. anybody who listens to this podcast for more than like two episodes is going to hear mm. about The Red Horse because mm-hmm. it is um, fiction about World War II, the preceding years up into the 1960s, mm. told from the perspective. Eugenio Corti is the author and he himself is an Italian veteran of mm-hmm. World War II oh, wow. yep. that was on the Russian front and okay. in the Balkans. And so you were talking about hearing from a non-Anglo-American yeah. perspective. Yes. Hmm. And so he shows both the Italian perspective and even mm-hmm. like the fractured nature of Italian culture mm-hmm. within that time period. Yep. You know, yep. were you supporting Mussolini or were you not? Mm-hmm. Or were you just yep. trying to make it as a peasant farmer in the mm-hmm. mountains? You know, yes. the, <laughs> All these kinds yep. of things. We're part of Austria and not part of Italy. Mm-hmm. And and the other thing that he covers is he looks into the mindset of a Russian soldier mm. mm-hmm. as well. And yep. um, even though they were allies, I think that's yet another very different perspective, mm-hmm. a very mm-hmm. different mindset. Yep. You know, we're talking about Oriental versus Occidental. We, we've got like... Yes. Oh, yeah, the whole Russian thing is, yeah. Yes, the Russian experience, I know, right? Because <laughs> um, other fiction that I've read that I love hearing a little bit of the mm. Russian perspective is Michael D. O'Brien's books. Right. Yep. His his fiction deals mm-hmm. pretty heavily in the, the, the Russian experience. But mm-hmm. I highly recommend The Red Horse. Okay. Because I just... And it's it's like a thousand pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I found a similar thing like with By Violence Unavenged was um, most of it set in Vienna, mm. in the, mm-hmm. of the Anschluss. And once mm. again, we can take a very comfortable attitude to that because, um, you know, particularly Anglo speakers um, don't know about the Austrian situation. They are not aware of what happened from you know the end of World War One to Hitler's takeover in 1938, um, and I thought it was really important to actually bring that out. You know what we're used to seeing is what you find in most documentaries. It's a whole lot of flag waving Viennese, you know, um, cheering. The sound as, of music, as, as, and, and the sound of music. Yeah, is Hitler's tanks 
parade down the main streets in Vienna, you know, um, not knowing what went on beforehand um, and for how long and to understand what the attitudes were around it and also how society was, you know, cowed into submission. And I think particularly in this present day, it was a very interesting um, study in social engineering um, that went on there. And um, it was fascinating to write about, that's for sure, um, mm. particularly with what was going on when I, when I was writing in 2016. We had the whole gay marriage debate and everything and um, seeing playing outs um, of, of things like, you know, saying yes to love is love and all the rest of it and mm-hmm. the the tensions around that and um, at that time I was I was actually writing about the Anschluss in Austria and the um, subsequent elections um, and once again it was a very interesting um, social experiment. There's nothing new under the sun. Um, no. Well I think it's time to set aside world wars for a couple minutes Mm -hmm. and we're going to do our rando round. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but you get to pick your dice. I've got percentile dice and then we've got our hundred over caffeinated questions. Okay. (laughs) And we'll, we get to just know a little bit more about you through this. So your choices of dice are pink with green mermaid sparkles or tie dye. I'll go pink with mermaid sparkles, please. All right, we will go pink with mermaid sparkles. It's a sparkly kind of day. Let's see where we go with this. We've got 78. How do you want to be remembered? Ooh. Um, If I really give my ego sway, it's one of the most brilliant authors that ever lived. Uh (laughs) (laughs) A humble, honest answer. I've got a little work to do. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Um, I would have to say I I would love to be able to make a lasting impression. I would love to live beyond my life. I love it because that's what art can do. Yeah, exactly. So I guess you have work to do, like you said. I do. I have a lot of hard work to do, especially when I berate myself after every book and think, oh, come on. (laughs) You're doing marvelously. You've impacted my life. (laughs) And that's all that matters, right? (laughs) Well, let's see what else we come up with here. I've got 93. Ooh, I've been wanting to ask this question. Okay. What is your biggest kitchen fail? Um, Happened when I was 12, and I decided I would make coconut ice. Mm. I had not had much cooking experience outside packet cakes at that point anyway. So pulled out this recipe and said, boil the milk and sugar for five minutes. And being a rookie, I boiled it on high for five minutes. And the sugary milk boiled over the saucepan and down the sides and uh, over the stove and I wasn't quite sure what to do about this, but decided I thought the best thing would be to take the stove, take the saucepan to the sink. And that involved going across the kitchen. So I took the saucepan with the boiling syrupy, milky substance in it from the stove to the sink. And of course, it boiled over in the process. So there was now syrupy stuff all over the kitchen floor. It got tipped into the sink. And also one room was quite hot too. Anyway, I then had, of course, mop up the floor. But before I mopped up the floor, the cat came in. And the sight of the cat walking across and putting a paws in this stuff and then flicking it here and flicking it there. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) So you made caramel kitty print art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. All right, let's see what else we got here. 58. What is your favorite thing about writing? Oh, do we want favorite um, because I just love this sort of thing or favorite because it's the most meaningful? What comes to your mind the first? Well, both things came to my mind simultaneously. Mm. 
I have a one track mind, so I don't have that problem. Um, I would say, I I would say, it'd be the concocting process, um, the the research, the exploration, the the tantalizing beginnings with characters the, the oh this the excitement of all that um so there's the superficial favorite aspect of writing is the creative brainstorming um the deeper favorite aspect of writing would have to be the um self-knowledge mm. oh that and the the growth that comes as a result of that um, is just that is that is very 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 satisfying um, to be able to write out certain aspects of private experience in a safe way and give it a voice that it would not always always have is very very satisfying. Um, it happened for the first time in one particular character in Distant Prospect. And it was just so wonderful to be able to put so much that I had bottled up inside that particular character and then to give them floor space in the second book. Um, to, to develop an alter ego, um, it's not really an alter ego, it is actually to be able to put oneself and to, to put the, yeah, it's just to put the more intimate aspects of one's psyche in a more public way. Mm -hmm. is is a lovely thing to do and in that to grow from that it's, so it's not just an ego exercise it's simply a it's it's a growth exercise you're uh, teasing out your experience yes yes and to be able to use writing in that way to understand things more say like for instance violence by violence unavenged and the trilogy that it's part of in the hearts of kings um it was to deal with the problem of what do you do in a situation where you have something you cannot resolve or it's, you are, it's beyond your capacity to resolve either because of your personality, because of circumstances, because persons involved are, are dead, um, the, because um, it's, it's, life is going against you. Um, also, it's not dependent on you to solve it. It's actually dependent on another person to resolve it. Um, how do you handle that? And it was actually in response to a personal situation, um, but to be able to transfer that to another time, to another character, another set of characters, and to work through that. And I found this most interesting because my initial response, where do you forgive, um, and using forgiveness as a possible resolution, has morphed into something way more complex, way more interesting. Um, way deeper and that has further enriched my my faith, my interior life and that's another thing I love to do with I'm writing is to put aspects of that interior life into my writing. Um, I will say like with, within the hearts of kings, the one of the central motives and um, certainly is one of the central things while I'm writing it is the dialogue between Christ and the good thief mm. um, on the cross. So that where the good thief comes to our Lord's defence, this man has done no wrong and acknowledges the fact that he is the one who is the, the sinner and therefore corrects the bad thief. And then he turns to our Lord and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into thy kingdom, your kingdom. And he says to him, you know, truly this day you shall be with me in paradise. The, the, the greatness of that. Um, and so this, but it's just such an interesting study of um, of justice and mercy. Well, and even just the grace that he could turn to Christ and just, in such a vulnerable manner, bear everything to him mm. and, and say, "Just remember me." I mean, mm. who who would have the gall to say this to an earthly king just in his court oh remember me you know when you're in your, fu your the fullness yeah. of your office but it's preceded by an acknowledgement of truth this mm -hmm. man has done no wrong and we have mm -hmm. and it's that premise 
that he then turns to our Lord and says, Lord, remember me. Um, and our Lord can say to him, yes, truly, because of the acknowledgement of that fundamental truth. Mm. So the key to it all is humility? That's what all the saints say, and I keep yes, hearing it. But but also that mercy is grounded on justice, mm -hmm. which is grounded on truth. That just forgive is a, an important disposition, but it is not a solution. Mm -hmm. um, it is important to have an attitude of forgiveness, but um, the steps to that – uh, well, what that attitude of forgiveness therefore must require that I do. Mm -hmm. it, it's not something vapid. It's got to be something very real um, and everything. And that, that our Lord's forgiveness was grounded on the truth of recognition that there had been wrong done and that Christ was king. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that leads me to my last question, mm -hmm. which is, what gives you hope right now? Hmm. What gives me hope right now? The fact that um, on a personal level much has been resolved is something that has become a platform for hope because um, over the past couple of decades life hasn't been that easy and um, writing was a means for Hope, in fact, it's one of the themes of distant prospect is 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 hope. Um, that that has shifted. Um, that in the fact that things I thought could never been resolved have been resolved gives me grounds for the fact there is hope for further resolution. Mm. Um, I, I have an interesting thing that, that um, we've just finished a very large-scale renovation of our house, which was um, falling to bits um, prior to, and the renovation has taken us 16 years <laughs> to achieve. Not that the renovation process was gone going for 16 years, but we had to live in an increasingly dilapidated house um, and finally we were able to do it. Interestingly enough, we bought the house as a Novena to St. Joseph, we prayed to St. Joseph um, to find a house that we could afford and so forth. And um, sure enough, he did it, but he found us a not the house I would have expected. And um, anyway, this is the house we bought and we could afford it and it just suited us as a young family, but then it just really started to crumble. And I, by last year, I was practically screaming at St. Joseph, <laughs> fix it. <laughs> Can't do this anymore, fix it. When does it get fixed? In the year of St. Joseph. And it's just, we've just moved in and it's just before the year of St. Joseph ends. And I thought, I haven't even thanked him yet. Oh my goodness, I'm so stupid, St. Joseph. You are so <laughs> humble. You haven't even said anything to me. He never does. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's that sort of resolution that um, I think sometimes we need prayers answered in order to have hope. <laughs> and um, it was the whole thing of, you know, things never being answered. And, you know, it's one of the themes of, you know, one of Lucy's plights in A Distant Prospect is the fact that, you know, why is everything so horrible and hopeless and everything? Um, and how, how does it, how do you get out of this? And, but it's that turning point for her, that year in which she narrates Distant Prospect, is that that year, that's the year where things begin to change. So where's the year in our lives where things begin to change or we begin yeah, to recognize? recognize? Yeah, and there, there'll be many of those. You know, life life is that, that process and, um, you know, that, that, that ongoing towards our heavenly goal, you know, is filled with so many of those, those points. Um, mm. and I think it's also important, you know, I hope when one is writing, because I can tell you writing sometimes is like going through a tunnel and you, <laughs> um, you've got to go through the tunnel. You've got to go and do it. You've got to do it. But, you know, and coming out the other end and since I'm, I'm in the tunnel at the moment and, um, in fact, oh, one of the poems that came to mind that sort of boosted me in writing by violence and avenged is William Wordsworth's Resolution and Independence. And 
they were the two qualities I needed in order to write resolution and independence. And mm. um, that's it's why I call um, parts of my blog leech gathering and then bloodletting is the editorial part. Um, <laughs> It's of course it's it's words with experience of seeing the leech gatherer on the moor picking up all the all the all the leeches um, for the medicinal purposes and mm -hmm. painstaking and dirty and yucky process, and he sees this happening right at a time where he's going through a real downies you know this, this thing to be able to write but then you've got the weight of all the greats behind you and wanting to be able to write something and leave a legacy. Um, but so overwhelmed by the the art of it all, and you know the art that has gone and gone past, and you know you're not imitating. You've got to stand on your own two feet, and it's so hard. And he sees this guy picking the leeches up, and it's dirty work, and he's happy because he knows that it's going to provide health to you know to the the people who need it, and. You know, words, yeah, writing is like leech gathering. You know, it's just bits here and bits there and it's a slow, painstaking, not terribly pleasant process, but there will be tremendous effects from it that one doesn't really necessarily know about. So, yes, that gives me hope too that um, – and you just have to, yep, you have to stand on your own two feet and write your book. And what a great note to end on that we have to write our book and then throw it into the pond. <laughs> <laughs> and Annette, I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a fantastic time. Oh, thank you, Jane. It's been wonderful to talk and um, I don't have many opportunities to talk about writing and this has been lovely to be able to um, give that particular voice to it. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. If you enjoyed listening to this conversation, click on the follow button for more tales every other Tuesday. And in the meantime, read stories that matter because you are living one.